I am honored to introduce Ariel Berger to all of you. Ariel is a writer, artist, teacher, and rabbi whose work combines spirituality, creativity, and strategy strategies for social change. A lifelong student of Eli Wiesel, he spent years studying the great wisdom traditions and now applies those teachings to urgent contemporary questions. When Ar Ariel's not learning or teaching, he is creating music, art, and poetry. He lives outside of Boston with his family. This evening, he is going to talk about his new book, Witness, uh, Lessons from Elie Wiesel's Classroom. Ariel first met Elie Wiesel at age 15. They studied and taught together. Witness chronicles the intimate conversations between these two men over decades as Berger sought counsel on matters of intellect, spirituality, and faith while navigating his own personal journey from boyhood to manhood, from student and assistant to rabbi and in time teacher. He will be in conversation with Sarah Her Herwitz, head speechwriter for Michelle Obama from 2008 to 2017, who was then appointed to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council by Barack Obama. Everyone, let us please welcome Errol Berger and Sarah Horowitz. Thank you. Before we start, I just wanted to acknowledge a special person in the audience. My editor is here tonight, Sarah Sherville, sitting in the front row, who's Imprimatur and wisdom are on every page of this book. So I'm really happy to be here with all of you and with her. And thank you for having us. Great. Well, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, Ariel and I met at a conference maybe, what, a year ago, two years ago? And just I am utterly delighted to be a part of this conversation. So let's, let's get started. I think, you know, I first want to kind of set the stage for, you know, how did you get to know Professor Wiesel, you know, what, what was your relationship like? Like, how did you sort of cultivate this years long relationship with this extraordinary man? So I met Elie Wiesel when I was 15 years old at a time when uh, I hadn't figured everything out yet. And a time that I was really um, confused about a lot of things and, and starting to ask important questions about my life and particularly about the relationship between the deeply religious community that I, in, in part, was brought up in and and the role of art and creativity because I was I was an artist I identified as an artist from a very young age my father's a composer and I was looking for people who were able to bridge those two worlds and I saw Elie Wiesel as someone who could do that and I met him after one of his lectures in New York my my soon to be stepfather introduced me to him after the lecture and I remember that he held out his hand to me and he said his name as if I didn't know who he was, even though he had just given a lecture to 2,000 people. And I really saw that modesty that I continue to see over the years. Um, and for the next 10 years or so, I met with him sporadically and brought my questions to him about religious life, about faith and doubt, about uh, considering different career paths and things like that. He was very generous with his time. And and then in, in 1996, I enrolled in his class at Boston University where he taught for almost 40 years. And I was very, very shy in class. I sat in the corner hoping not to be noticed. And I said one word the entire semester. And that was only because he asked a question and he looked at me and he waited and he continued to wait. And so I had no choice. And I said the word that was in my head, which was authenticity. And he nodded and said, exactly. And a few weeks later, he asked me to become his teaching assistant the following year at BU, and which was incredible and a big surprise to me. I didn't fully understand the, why he was asking me. You know, we, I knew him, but not yet that well. And I actually declined because I was on my way to study in, in a traditional place of study in, in Israel. I, was, I wanted to go deeply into the Jewish texts of my tradition. Uh, and I felt, frankly, that I didn't have enough to offer yet because I hadn't really studied anything that deeply. So I declined and I said, I wrote him a letter and I, and I called him afterwards and he said, I read your letter, I understand, and I'll wait for you. And when you're finished, come back. And I thought he was being kind, but he meant it. And seven years later, I went back to Boston and enrolled in a graduate program and became his TA. And then there was a structure, we met every week and I really became a lot closer with him then. 
Wow. That's pretty amazing. That one sort of meeting as a young person that sort of continued on through your life. It's pretty extraordinary. So, you know, what was, what was this classroom like? I mean, I think something that I found fascinating in your book is that, you know, when I think of Elie Wiesel, I think Holocaust survivor, I think Nobel prize winner, but you say in your book, in your book that the label that he used for himself was teacher. That's the label he most embraced. So why did he teach? What, what was it like being in his classroom? So first of all, you're absolutely right. If you asked him who, who he was and what his life was about, it was, it was teaching. And he said, teaching inspires everything else that I do. And I think that for him, teaching was, um, first of all, something he had been primed for since his childhood. Um, he was asked sometimes, who would you have been if the Holocaust hadn't happened? And his answer was, I would have been a teacher. I became a teacher, but I would have been a teacher in a different context, in a, in a very traditional Jewish context. But I was always going to be a teacher. And he shared that he borrowed the one typewriter in his small town in, in, in Hungary to write a book of his biblical commentaries at the age of 13. And that book was lost, and he was grateful because he said they weren't very good commentaries. Um, <laughs> but I think he saw teaching as really the center of, of hope, the source of hope in the world for a better life of the world. And he saw that students can really become activated moral creatures and he wanted to he wanted to invest in that so he loved it he enjoyed it he he loved learning um, and I think he wanted to share that love it was very contagious he wanted to share it with people of of all ages and so even when he had to travel he had to travel a lot for all kinds of things for conferences and and whatever else and he he made every effort to come back to class and when he couldn't he occasionally would call in on, on a get on a conference call with his students uh, from Paris or somewhere to apologize for not being there, to have 10 minutes on the phone talking about the, the weekly reading. And he remained extremely dedicated to that for his whole life. That is, that's pretty amazing. What was, I mean, can you share, you know, a story or two, just like paint a scene of like, what, what was he like as a teacher? Like, what did it look like? What did it feel like? What, what would be a way that he might present a lesson just to kind of give people a sense of what that, what it was like to be in his classroom? So to set the, the scene a little bit, so there's a, uh, a, a room with about 65 or so people in the class. And um, depending on the size of the room, it changed over the years. There were people sitting on windowsills or in the aisles. It was very packed. Or they were a little more spread out if there was more room. Students of every age. There were undergrads and graduate students. And there were also evergreen students who were retirees who came to study in his class. Um, so that already gave it a certain warm feel, almost a, a familial feeling in class, which... Um, which had only had to do with the, the student body. And there were also students from all over the world. And many of them carried questions that were way beyond the academic, typical kinds of questions you would hear in a university classroom. There were grandchildren of survivors. There, were, there was a granddaughter of a Nazi officer in the class for several years running. There were survivors of violence in various countries around the world, activists. And, and so their questions were very personal and the first thing you have to know about his class was that he really welcomed that. I had other professors who wanted the questions to be kept to the kind of cerebral, intellectual realm. And, and he knew that learning is a, an emotional process as much as it is an intellectual one. So he welcomed those questions. And, and he also, as I said, he really loved and cherished his students. He also honored them. So every class began with student presentations. If you walked into his lecture, the first thing you would hear and see would be two students, usually two students, presenting for the first 10 minutes of class. And I have to tell you, there were other students who were enrolled in the class, and then they were annoyed to find out that students started every lecture because they were there to hear from Elie Wiesel. But he really wanted students to learn from one another, and he, he valued that. So there were 10 minutes of student presentation, then he would respond. And students read a book a week, so we shared a text, Dostoevsky or Kafka or the book of Job or whatever it was. And so there was a shared language and shared questions. Often he would begin class by saying, what is this book about? Which sounds at first like a, like a very simple question, but that was his way of evoking first responses and reactions, which were often very different and diverse and sometimes surprising. And then he would build from that um, and sort of weave together different sources from the book itself, but also other things that he had learned, philosophical works and literary works and biblical works and works of commentary on the Bible and 
and mystical stories and occasionally his own stories. And he was a great raconteur. And so some, sometimes he would pause and begin to tell a story that could be very moving, intense, funny. Um, and there was a lot of emotional range in the class. And so you never really knew it was going to happen. And after about an hour and 15 minutes, he would very subtly look at his watch, which he wore on the inside of his wrist. Um, and that's how we knew class was going to end within the next two minutes. And he would fly off to wherever he had to go next. That's more or less what it looked like and what it felt like. There's a lot more to say, but those are sort of the, sort of the contours. That's pretty amazing. Um, so I think the question that, you know, I feel like this is almost the most cliche question, but it is certainly the question that I had when I first opened up your book, which is a question of resilience. It's, it's a question we all wonder, like, how did he continue on, right, after what he had been through? What was the key to his resilience and to just the extraordinary contributions that he went on in the world, that he went on to make in the world? You know, what, what, what fueled him? There was a point that I write about in the first chapter in which a, a student asked him that question. A student asked, how did you go on after the war, after the Holocaust? And he said, he said after liberation, we young people were taken to an orphanage and the adults in charge who worked for the International Red Cross asked every child, what can we bring you? And he said, one, child, one boy asked for a warm coat or sweater. Another asked for some chocolate. He said, I asked for the same volume of, uh, of Talmud, the classical Jewish text that I was studying before the war so that I could pick up my studies at the exact same line and the exact same word where I had been interrupted by the Nazi invasion of, of our town. And he said, that's what saved my sanity and my hope was learning. Learning saved me. And then he added, I think learning can save all of us. Um, so that gave him a tremendous sense of, of hopefulness and curiosity. Um, and I think with that, the relationships that he built with students, with close friends and colleagues had a big part in it also. Who's, I mean, did he have a sense of, of joy, of humor? I mean, would, did you kind of sense that in him at, at times with his students? So how many of you have read Night? Just show of hands. So the last scene of Night is Elie Wiesel at the age of 15 and a half or 16 looking into a mirror and he says, he writes, a corpse looked back. And I'm sure you remember that last moment in the book. And so if you only read Night, you would think he, this was not a person who would have had a lot of joy or humor, right? This is, this is certainly someone who's going to be depressive and, um, and is going to have a hard time in life. And, and he had moments like that, I'm sure. But the story I just told you about him asking for that book to continue his studies, it occurred to me just today that that happened right after that scene in Night. So he went from seeing the corpse in the mirror to choosing to learn. And by the time I knew him, he was already in his 60s, he, he was a very joyous person. And actually, when I, when I talk to teachers who teach night in high schools, the first thing I tell them is you need to know that the author of this book turned out to be a very joyous person. Um, and you can see that in some of his other works. His nonfiction works in French were all called Celebration. The works where, where he tells stories from the Bible or, or Hasidic tales were all called celebration of biblical tales, celebration of rabbinic tales, celebration of Hasidic tales. The titles changed in English, so you won't find those titles here, but um, that says something. I think he really, he said the enemy, we cannot let the enemy define us, right? What, what I went through should not define my life and what, what anyone goes through, any suffering that they go through needs to be honored and taken seriously, but it can't define our lives. We have to choose life. So he was a very, very joyous person. It reminds me that the story of him sort of asking for the Talmud is the first thing that he wanted as a child, you know, after, you know, in the orphanage. It makes me think of, I think it was it, I forget, I forget who it was. It was some German Jewish philosopher who said that the, you know, the Talmud is the portable homeland of the Jewish people. The sense that our texts are this kind of, you know, no matter how displaced we've been in the world, our texts are this home to which we can return. So he had sort of lost everything, been totally displaced, and yet he picked up right, he sort of went home, right? That was like the one home that was still there. And it, you know, it strikes me, a question that that raises is, so, you know, he went back to a religious text, essentially. What was the nature of his religious observance? Was it, did he continue the observance of his childhood? Did he pick that up there as well? Or was it a very kind of different, much more fraught? I, I'm sure it was much more fraught. How so? Well, he had a friend with whom he went through the, the camps. 
And that friend was from an equally religious and devout background. They both grew up in a very religious setting. Elie Wiesel was always studying and praying and trying to bring the Messiah to the world through mystical means. There are a lot of stories about this. We're talking about a teenage kid. I have teenage kids. This is not, this is not a typical story. Um, and and um, his friend also was involved in those kinds of spiritual endeavors. And the friend became a great rabbi and, and really came out with an even stronger sense of religiosity than before the war. And Elie Wiesel came out with a kind of shattered faith. And he began to ask questions about, and they're in night. If you read night, you know that these questions are there. How could God allow such a thing to happen? How could human beings allow such a thing to happen? Those are, two, those are the two defining questions of his life. And the second one, how can human beings have let this happen? Not only the perpetrators, but the bystanders, the ones who were silent, the indifference of the world, that became the source for his activism. The question of how did God let something like this happen led to all of his activities as a, he didn't like the word theologian, but basically a theologian, someone who was developing a new kind of faith. So it was very different than before the war. And he talked about a wounded faith. He talked about arguing with God as an expression of faith. And so his, what he called his quarrel with God meant that he could never settle for easy religious answers. Occasionally in class, someone would raise the question or the concept of miracles. There were a lot of ministry students in, in his classes. And someone would say, you know, I read a story that there was a miracle that happened to a certain person during those years of the Holocaust. And he would sort of get, he would sort of bridle at that. He would say miracles for some people, but not for others. Every time you tell a miracle story about that time or about any situation of suffering, you're also saying that God chose not to make miracles for so many other people. So the concept is sort of offensive, right? So he had that sense of, of not accepting easy traditional answers, but at the same time, he maintained his religious practices in, in, in most areas of life. And he did that because he felt such a loyalty to his, his ancestors, his father and his grandfather in particular. So, you know, we're in D.C., um, and I think a lot of us are finding that our country is at a difficult moment, I think is maybe a way to say it. Um, you know, we're seeing a public dialogue that's really defined by an incredible lack of complexity, by by a coarseness, by a real kind of vitriol and and hatred, and it's um, painful to watch. And as I was reading your book, I just I kept wondering, you know, what would this man say about this? And I, I know that's not necessarily a question that you can answer, but you know, given what you've learned from him over the years, what do you think are the key lessons from his life, from his writings that apply particularly right now? Thank you for the way you're asking the question because I, I don't feel that I can speak for him, but I can speak about him and share things that he taught that help me right now. Um, the first is that when, when you see the first signs of hatred, you have to fight it right away. That was something he told his students often. Uh, and it, it usually begins not with, not with actions and not necessarily with violence, but with words. So he cautioned us to pay careful attention to language. He asked, what's worse than evil? E evil in disguise is worse than evil, or evil wearing a mask. And so the first thing you have to do is name things well. And... He often said, you know, the first thing that Adam did in the biblical story of the Garden of Eden was name all the creatures. So we have to name things well with precision, and we have to think carefully about what's really happening, what's motivating, what's happening, and the different, all the different varieties of hatred. And at this point, he would usually say, isn't it unfortunate that we have so many words and varieties of hatred, words for and varieties of hatred? But he felt it was very important to name things correctly so that you can approach them correctly. That's number one. And to act quickly, because of course, he said worse than hatred is indifference. Because there are relatively few people who, who hate. There are, unfortunately, there are people who are driven by hate, but there are many, many more people who are indifferent or apathetic or complacent. And there are really two dangers that he talked about there if you want to maintain hope and do something useful for the world. One danger is despair. And he cautioned his students to never choose despair, but to, to insist on hope, even if it didn't look, even if in a certain moment it didn't look very hopeful. And the other danger is the opposite, it's complacency. It's feeling like everything's basically okay, or this isn't touching my life. And to remember that 
the distance between us is not so great. And if somebody is suffering on the other part of the, the other side of the world, it affects me very deeply. And that sense, that sense of, um, of um, intimacy with, with the world we live in and the sense of responsibility for others uh, is something that he wanted us to think about every day. And it's a sort of a massive homework assignment that he gave his students and anyone who reads his book to cultivate that. And at the same time, he often said, go easy on yourself. Don't try to do everything at once or feel bad about yourself because you're not doing enough. But keep that balance. Avoid complacency. Avoid despair. Keep hope. And the last thing I'll say, and there's so much, right? There's so much that he taught about this. But the last thing I'll say now is that he said it's really important to honor the particularity of the victims. And again, name things carefully and be very clear about the differences in our different stories. I think of the, the shooting at Tree of Life uh, Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and there were some tweets and responses that didn't mention that the victims were Jews um, for various reasons. And then I think about at the same, the flip side of that is, is make sure that you're not only privileging one instance of suffering over others, but connect across differences. And so I think about Jewish communities that responded to Tree of Life but didn't talk about Maurice Stallard and Vicki Lee Jones who were shot and killed in, in Louisville within a couple of days of that event, right? So there's a balancing act here of particular um, uh, care and care for the differences, but also connecting across difference. And that's something that I think we are not doing very well right now in this country, but it's, and we tend to make mistakes in both directions, but that's something that he was very insistent on and, and sort of trained his students to think in those terms. Really, uh, sort of wish he was here at this moment to to offer offer us some guidance. Um, so I think you know we now would be a good time to open it up to questions from all of you. you. There are two microphones. You can just line up, and we'll just toggle between them. Go ahead. Um. Thank you so much for your words today. I'm a college student here in the Washington D.C. area. And um, when I was in middle school, I wrote Professor Wiesel a letter to tell him how meaningful I had found night to be. And um, and he wrote me back an absolutely lovely letter. And um, he wrote me back an abs he wrote me back an absolutely lovely letter, which to this day I have framed and will always cherish. Um, after completing my studies, I'm seriously considering. I'm seriously considering teaching about the Holocaust and Professor Wiesel's kindness to me several years ago really has been a, really has been an important an important aspect of my journey of my journey. My question is um what advice would you offer to young people such as myself who are who are seriously considering working in Holocaust education? I, I first want to I want to just respond to the first part of what you shared. Elie Wiesel was someone who was involved in genocide prevention and human rights work around the world, but he also was somebody who, in very small ways, tried to live according to values of kindness and compassion and, and honor and respect for people. And so um, if you visit his, the archive that has his papers at Boston University, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of letters to which he responded from students in first grade and up, I think, maybe even younger. And um, there are many, many forewords to books and memoirs, particularly from Holocaust survivors, uh, that he offered. He volunteered to write the forewords. And he was very generous in that way. He was very generous that way with me, too. So it's always great to hear those stories. It was so much a part of who he was. And he believed that those things matter, too. So we can be kind to each other in small ways, too. And that's a big part of making the world a better place. It's not just changing policy. Um, as far as Holocaust education, there's, of course, a lot to say. The first thing I think he would say is thank you for even considering that uh, as a career direction. It's very important. Um, he spoke about memory as the key value and, and, and one that we have to honor and, and work on and invest in. And he didn't just mean remembering the facts. He meant the, the process of, of really entering the world of what happened before and allowing ourselves to be changed by that. He meant a kind of uh, imagination and empathy-based education that could sensitize people now um, 
so Holocaust education is not just about remembering something terrible that happened. It's about recognizing, and I'm not saying anything new here, by the way. This is the foundation of the, the United States Holocaust Museum here in Washington and of Facing History and Ourselves and other organizations that do Holocaust education. It's about applying the lessons today. And so the one piece of advice I can share, I can pass along is, don't just share with students the story of the Holocaust. Share, share at least as much and probably twice as much about the communities that existed before the Holocaust, what that life was like, what the culture was like, what the stories were, what the songs and melodies are, many of which are lost, but some we have. And sharing that, I think, is equally important for, for a sense of connection and continuity to both the immensity of what happened and what was lost, but also to the life that was there before. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what his views were on Israel. Uh, I'm a Jew, I'm very dedicated to Israel, but I'm very troubled by its policies, which has hit a lot of American Jews. And he seems so good on human rights and everything else, but he never I never heard him speak out about uh, policies in Israel that many of us disagree with. It's a great question. There are three, three things to say about this. One is, I talk to him about this a lot, um, particularly when I was living there. So his analysis of the situation over the years, I think 1995 until the last conversation we had about this in 20, 20, 2013 probably, was that his, his, his honest analysis was that most of the responsibility for the current situation lies with the Palestinian leadership, not the Palestinian people. And he talked about the corruption and the use of funds to build mansions and things like that. And he really felt that that was the, the major block to a peace agreement after Oslo and after other attempts to make peace. You can agree or disagree with that. That was his assessment. Um, but more important to me, he, he was in close touch with presidents and prime ministers, including the prime minister of Israel and the whoever was the sitting head of the United Nations at the time. And so his conversations with them, he shared with me, that was where he raised his critiques of particular policies. And um, they listened. I mean, not always. And he sometimes in class bemoaned the times that he had shared messages with heads of state and didn't do anything. He gave ex many, he shared many examples of that very openly with his students. But on occasion, it made a difference both here in this country and in Israel. So that was where he really put his efforts. And the final thing is he wrote about this, not often, but um, he wrote a letter to a young Jew and he wrote a letter to a young Palestinian and they're in the same book. Um, I think the book is called A Jew Today, but I'm not 100% sure I might be mixing it up. And that's where he really laid out his thinking about the conflict. Um, which has evolved and changed even over the last several years. So I don't know what he would say today, but I know that's where he articulated his position in the late 80s, early 90s. Did he support Oslo, two states? Or he did. Huh? He did. He, he, yeah. he, you know, he really, I mean, this is also important to say, there were moments that were very um, seemingly hopeless, right, in thinking about that intractable conflict. And he was often asked this question, and he always said, I believe there will be peace in that part of the world. I believe it 100%. I, I see it. He said, I see it. I see the obstacles, but I see the peace beyond the obstacles. And so any attempt, any reasonable attempt to make peace is worth supporting. And he supported Oslo, and he supported Madrid, and he supported many of those attempts, again, in conversation with Shimon Peres and other people who were involved in Yossi Sarid and other people on the Israeli side who were working to make peace. Elie Wiesel was involved behind the scenes with some of those processes. Thank you. Good evening. I don't, is this working? You can probably hear me anyway. I have one of those voices. <laughs> yeah, hi. First of all, I'd like to thank you so much for your book. Um, I somehow, sometimes I think my life is divinely led because there's like really no reason for me to be here tonight except I got in my car and it made me drive here. And uh, the connection with uh, the person who's interviewing you. In 2008, actually I was a lawyer before, and Barack Obama called for people to teach in public schools. 
So I decided to take on this challenge, and that's been 10 years that I've been doing that. And actually, I work in what are considered difficult schools, and sometimes I wonder, like especially this week, if it's really worth it. So thank you so much for your book, because I came here, and in the hour that I've been reading it, I haven't bought it yet, and I will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> But it is already, almost every single page is, is just so much wisdom and so much, um, it's so rich. I, I don't know if I, when I get through the rest of it, what it's going to do. I'm, but, I'm not sure you should buy it. Maybe you should leave that annotated version here for everyone else. So I'm just wondering, I'm really like sort of crying in the first 10 pages. Did you write this to make me cry in the first 10 pages? I didn't, um, but I but I wrote a lot of the book in the period after he died. So there's there is a lot of um, grieving in the in the process of writing. I think that might somehow come through. There was also a lot of joy and gratitude and other things, but that was a part of the process. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think it'll make me a better teacher because I do not start out my classes with "You are the best class I have ever ever had." And at the end of the year, say, you know, I was absolutely right. You're even better than that. And I, that I will do. It is like, that's what you need to do. So I'm actually learning to be a better teacher in the first few pages. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> Those are lucky kids. I'm not sure. When did he pass away? June, uh, July 2nd, 2016. Okay. So I was born in 1947. Um, as I was growing up, people were learning more and more about the Holocaust, and it was more and more distressing. Um, and of course, I was Jewish. I am Jewish. Um, and we thought, never again. And it's now happened more than once. Cambodia, Rwanda, and now Syria, and Yemen. And some of these he was still alive for. And basically... Uh, people did nothing. Um, I mean, there was much. There is much hand wringing, for instance, about Yemen, and Yemen is being carpet bombed by Saudis in U.S. planes. Uh, and you know, you can write letters and this and that. But what did he recommend that people do? This is maybe the one of the top three most important questions and subjects in in Elie Wiesel's classroom, as well as in his work, because that was a question that came up all the time in every course he taught. And by the way, in 40 or so years of teaching, he never repeated a course um, because he always wanted to be challenged and, and see something new himself. Um, but he always touched on these questions no matter what we were studying. We could be studying the book of Genesis. He would, he would talk about whatever was happening that day in, in, in terms of oppression, war, genocide. He would bring it back to that several times throughout the semester. Um, you know that he himself was, was active in all of those events. He went to Cambodia. He went to Sarajevo. He was involved in um, it, actually in the founding of the, the inauguration of the United States Holocaust Memorial. He wrote a speech by hand and it rained really hard and his speech ran. And so he spoke extemporaneously and he spoke, um, he turned to President Clinton and said, "We, I've been in Sarajevo. I cannot sleep for what I've seen. We have to do something. And President Clinton later said, in his drawl, Elie Wiesel got me to get up. He basically said, get off your butt and do something about Yugoslavia. And so that, that was one of the times that really his words did make a difference. He also had something to do with President Clinton apologizing for American non-intervention in Rwanda. But what kind of consolation prize is that? Right? But, but so he struggled with this himself. Elie Wiesel in class would say, I, I, he would quote Kafka who said, uh, who told a story of a messenger who never arrives to deliver his message. And Elie Wiesel would say, there's something worse than that, which is a messenger who has delivered the message and nothing has changed. And he felt that way very often. He worried, did my words make a difference? Did night make a difference? Did sharing what happened to my people make a difference? And by difference, he meant, of course, stopping genocide. That's like a pretty low moral bar, right? But he also meant, but he also meant just let the victims know that they're not alone. He said that if we, had, if we had known, he said, in our town in Siget, in Hungary, Romania, in the Carpathian Mountains, we had the BBC. We had Radio BBC. 
And if we had just heard someone from the West say, we know what's happening, we can't do anything to help right now, but we're with you, it would have made a difference. And by the way, also, if they had said, here's what's happening, we wouldn't have gone like sheep on the trains. We would have escaped. We had opportunities to escape into the forest. We would have done so. We had no idea. We didn't even believe the people who told us. So stopping genocide, but even just protesting, even just letting victims know that they're not alone, um, that's what he wanted to see happen. And that's something that stopping genocide really goes to his efforts to both name things as genocide. For example, Darfur, right? I was in class with him during during that that period where Darfur was in the news. There's still there's still terrible things happening there. But this is 2003. To, by 2009, I think 350,000 people were dead, 1.1 million people displaced. And Elie Wiesel spent a lot of his time trying to convince the United Nations to publish a daily death toll. And he came back to class once really frustrated because he had met with Kofi Annan and it, it didn't work. They didn't, they didn't do it. And he was incredibly frustrated. He, th he thought that's something that would raise consciousness and make it urgent and maybe it would lead to some kind of intervention. But at least people would know. And it didn't happen. But he did succeed in persuading the United Nations to call what was happening a genocide. And later the United States government followed suit. Colin Powell said that what was happening in Darfur was, is a genocide. And so a student asked, by the way, why does it matter? And Elie Wiesel said, you know, if it's mass murder, we also need to intervene. But naming things with precision matters because when you call it a genocide, you can bring a sitting president up on criminal charges at the International Criminal Court. And that's what happened. Um, and President al-Bashir was indicted a few years later. He was indicted but not arrested, and it didn't stop what was happening. It didn't stop the Janjaweed. It didn't stop the, the genocide. But at least there was a statement, and he knew that he couldn't leave his country without getting arrested. So at least that was some kind of you know, thin progress. But, he, but to answer your question, after all of that, he really felt that every one of us can make a difference, not only through the political channels that we know and hopefully use of con contacting our representatives in government, but raising consciousness. And one of the examples of this is, even though the, the governmental policy didn't change sufficiently around Darfur, the Save Darfur campaign, which was started primarily by Jewish and Armenian leaders, local grassroots leaders. Thanks. Um, why Jewish and Armenian? Because they had both experienced genocide, right? They knew what it was like. And so they were at the forefront of starting this campaign, which, raised, which is the only reason that many people heard about Darfur. So he really felt that local and grassroots activism can make a big difference. And the activism can be on the level of bearing witness, saying, we know what's happening and we care. Writing about that, speaking about that, talking to friends about that. Again, in modest ways, he really believed that ultimately that could make a difference together with bigger efforts and more um, immodest, ambitious efforts to change governmental policy. And he said to his students, we need both. Because students would ask him, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not able to or we're not going to travel around the world showing up in these places and bearing witness in person. What can we do? And his message was, your decision to teach, your decision to be kind to someone on a bus, your decision to raise consciousness in your own family, in your own circle, that's part of the same puzzle. All of that is necessary. All these efforts are needed and none of them are wasted. And eventually he believed they might reach a tipping point. They haven't yet. Right? This is what, what keeps me up at night is I know all of this from him. I'm not doing enough. The world is still very broken. Will the world hear Elie Wiesel's message? That was not a question that was resolved in his lifetime. That's really up to us. So I share your question and the urgency of the question. I wish I had better answers. But I think that we have a lot of work to do and we have to do it together. And one other question along the same lines, and that is um, refugees uh, coming to this country. Um, I have learned, I mean, when I grew up, you know, we went to visit the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your hungered masses, your need to be free, all of that. And we're turning away uh, refugees that are going back to war zones. Um, we don't let in any Muslims at all, not not just the terrorists, but the people who are fleeing from terrorism, they're Muslims too. And Trump has issued a Muslim ban and the Supreme Court has agreed with it. Moral. I mean, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an attorney and I've read it. Um, it's 
it's not what it should be, and it's not going to change. Um, has he taught you any anything we can do besides write letters, join protests, give money to Hayas and the ACLU and other people who are objecting to that? What else is there? Yeah. So first, first I'll say that Eli Wiesel spoke about refugees a lot. He said no human being is illegal. Um, he himself was a refugee for a long time. He was a stateless person, and he had tremendous gratitude to this country for giving him a, his first passport. Actually, his second passport. His first passport was um, was um, uh, received after a lot of effort by his father in in Siget in, in Hungary. Um, they had their papers, and there was a a, a pre invasion. Um, um, action where all the Jews in the community were gathered and asked to present their papers. And he said he remembers as a boy, he went with his family and they presented their papers to the, to the government officials. The government officials took the papers and ripped them to shreds and said, go home. The papers were worthless. Um, and so he had tremendous gratitude for having papers and he, and he supported efforts to, um, to open the gates. He also thought about the St. Louis, the, the ship that was turned back during the Holocaust and exactly. ultimately people were sent to their deaths. So about which he said, by the way, we're all in the same boat, right? We all, we, we're all in the same boat, literally and figuratively, literally then, figuratively now. I think that in addition to lobbying and, and the traditional forms of activism and community organizing, which are important, he also always brought it back to the human element. And one of the things that he told us was find someone in that community who lives here and learn more about their story, learn more about their community, learn more about the, their co-religionists or family members, however close or distant, who are going through whatever they're going through in Syria or Yemen. Ask them, what does it look like from your vantage point? What does it feel like from your vantage point? And bear witness to their stories so that when you do your activism, you're armed with those personal, powerful, real, immediate stories. Otherwise, the language is just sort of policy language, right? Mm -hmm. And it's and that has failed us. Right. We need a we need a more moving, emotionally profound language if we're going to succeed in making a difference. Thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you. I apologize. I did not hear the first part of your presentation, and I look forward to reading the book, which I haven't read yet. I came to ask in regard of the Center for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown University, two recent events. Uh, if you treat in this book the subject neutrality and the approach to international and diplomatic affairs that seem to be an enlargement of understanding and wisdom and law, fundamental to Eli Weissel's understanding. So the question is about neutrality? Yes, sir. So we know that he said neutrality never helps the victim, it only helps the oppressor or the victor. Mm -hmm. And and so there's no such thing really as being a bystander. Um, so one, of, one of the reasons for the title of the book, witness is, is a word that he used a lot. And he said that listening to a witness makes you a witness, which means that if you hear someone's story, you become somehow activated by that story. And now that story inhabits you and you have to act, you have to live, you have to speak and think differently. Um, and it's an action, and it's and the opposite of witness, he said, is to be a spectator. Um, and so there's no such thing really as neutrality because once you once you fool yourself into thinking that you're remaining neutral in in moral terms, um, uh, we're not talking about necessarily international relations and the level of neutrality during war and giving refugees from both sides opportunity to escape. That's a different story and a, a complex question. But in the level of moral neutrality, when you hear about something terrible happening, you say, I, I don't want to take sides. Um, you are helping the oppressor. This happened during Darfur too, by the way. The, the government of Sudan said it's not a genocide, it's a civil war. right? And so if you, if you buy into that, you're not helping. And that was his bottom line. We can, uh, I have a loud voice, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Oh, is it? Is it working? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm curious, you know, did he, with all of the work he did, all of the activism, you know, all of his writing, did he feel like he was making a difference? You know, do you sense that, did he have any regrets? 
he had, he had, I think he had better days and worse days, more hopeful days and less hopeful days, depending on what was happening that day in the news. Um, but in general, he was a very hopeful person and, and, and that was a moral choice. You know, I, I saw this over and over again when people, when students would say, really, there's, I mean, how can there be reason to hope when you, all you have to do is read the news on any given day or read a work of history and open randomly to any page. You'll find some instance of something that turns your stomach. How, how can you be hopeful? And he quoted Albert Camus, who said, where there's no hope, we have to create it um, because hoping is a moral choice. And, you know, what, what's the alternative? So you give up hope. You don't do anything to help. The world's going to continue and it's on a downward spiral. If you hope, you might strike out. You might not make a difference. He felt he might not have made a difference, but at least there's a chance that one word will make a difference. And, and he was able to point to things that were, that were real practical differences, um, both on, on the international level and, and also in very small, modest ways with, with the students, with, with having a child, right? With, with choosing to have a child for Elie Wiesel was not a simple thing at all. And for a long time, he thought he wouldn't do that because how can you bring children into a world in which a Holocaust could happen? But he made a moral choice for hope, and that was a form of resistance. So I think he, um, I think when pushed, he would say, maybe my words have made a difference in some small ways. He was, he was realistic and modest about that, but I don't think he had any regrets. I think all the efforts, he believed, I think all the efforts were worthwhile and none of them were wasted and none of them for us are wasted either. It's funny just hearing two of the stories here tonight, right? I mean, if these two people are going to be teaching hundreds, thousands of students, each of whom goes on to live a life impacting hundreds or, th I mean, you're talking about a pretty epic ripple effect. So he, he certainly, it seems like he's certainly at the very least affected you know, millions of people around the world. I'm curious about the role of friendship in his life. I mean, you clearly had this very close friendship with him. It seems like he cultivated a number of of such relationships, what what role did friendship play in his life? Well, I have to say first, I, di I didn't think of my relationship with him as as a friendship, exactly. Even though, of course, there are elements of that, and I think he, and he he called himself my friend, but I I just there's there's some complexity there for me in relating to a teacher as a friend. So there, that's a whole conversation. <laughs> um, but he he valued friendship a lot, and he he said friendship is my religion. And he said, that's good, because then if I become a fanatic, a religious fanatic, it'll just mean that I'm a, I'm a super friend <laughs> and no one will get hurt. <laughs> um, but he wanted his students to be friends also and to cultivate friendships. And he um, sometimes he would start class, start the semester by saying, I hope that some of you will meet one another on an airplane or in a restaurant 20 years from now. And you'll remember, you'll say, didn't we study... Job or Kafka or Kierkegaard in a classroom in Boston. He really wanted that. He wanted people to develop relationships because I think partly he, he, he really honored that from his background, his Jewish and Hasidic background that really celebrates friendship. But I think also because the kind of learning, the kind of transformative learning, the kind of moral education that he was invested in, it doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in relationship. It happens when someone different that from you, whether in background or in ways of thinking, somehow impacts you. You encounter otherness. And he said, it is the otherness of the other which fascinates me. Um, he didn't want people to be all alike. He really, he loved difference because that's a reason for celebration and, and learning. So he wanted the learning to, and the wrestling with ideas and texts to happen in relationship with him, but also students with one another. He also said, I don't have a lot of friends because friendship is such an art form. It takes so much, you know, not just energy, but, but talent. You have to really work to have what friendships, to have friendships be what they really should be, that I have very few friends, but the ones I have, I really cherish. Interesting. Um, what would you say, you know, thinking about what your life would have been like if you had not met him versus your life as it is having met him? What was it that he did for you personally? What was it that he brought out in you personally? How did he change your life as one person? There are a lot of things, um, but I'll say three. One is, one is he had tremendous belief in me from a very early age, like from early on. He said things to me that no one had ever said. And, you know, we talk about the tap on the shoulder when someone believes in you and really lets you know, reflects to you that you have something to give. That, that can be a radical message. Um, and that's related to the second thing, which is that I, I became a teacher because of him. I don't just mean as, as a profession, but I mean, 
I became a teacher with him. Um, and I was sort of, as his teaching assistant, it was my job to lead the discussion section around his lecture. So that meant that before and after his lecture, uh, we, I had an hour with students. And when I started, I had very little idea what I was doing. And, um, and I didn't, he didn't, uh, Professor Wiesel didn't train me. I was sort of thrown into this. And, um, and something about the structure, something about the proximity to him, the ability to come to him with my questions about that, um, that became a kind of apprenticeship that allowed me to, um, to figure it out and, uh, and, to, and to really build on the questions of the people in the room rather than have some kind of prefabricated thing that I wanted to teach. That, that, became, that became the learning of how to teach. It was like, find out who's in the room and what they're carrying and weave something together not in a frontal way, but together, weave something together, build something together out of that. Um, and, and so that, that really, that, that changed my life. And the final thing is I started with the moment I met him at the age of 15 and I was trying to figure out how religious life and art and creativity fit together. And he really became the person who helped me reconcile those two things. Um, the world of my mother and the world of my father, the world of my mother was all about learning and religious life. And my father is all about creativity and wildness in the service of that creativity and freedom. And, and Elie Wiesel became the person who was able to, for me, model how do you integrate those two things. He was a writer. He was an artist. He was a deeply religious person, but with a wounded faith, a complex faith. He remembered what it was like before the war, the, the, the communities that were lost that my teachers in my religious school always talked about, but in a mythical kind of way. He actually was there. He was from there. He spoke that language. He, he could speak the language of religious practice and of art and of current events seamlessly. And that was an incredible lesson for me. So I guess, you know, another question I've been thinking about is, did he have relationships and connections with other survivors? You know, was there that kind of community or network of support or was it something that he more sort of left behind later in his life? Oh, he, ab he absolutely stayed connected to survivors. First, the, the close friends from his childhood, there were only a handful. I, I've, I met the son of one of them recently, and I met one of the other friends who's, who's still alive. Um, there were about five of them who not only went through the war together, but they were in the orphanage together. So they stayed in very close touch um, and had a very special relationship that I think none of them had with anyone who hadn't been through those experiences. But there's also, of course, a network of survivors and children of survivors, and, and, and uh, Professor Wiesel was very close to, that, to those those communities and supported them and encouraged, encouraged survivors to write their memoirs. Um, I mean, there are many memoirs of Holocaust survivors that were only written because he, he said, you have to share your story. And, and many survivors didn't want to talk about it because it's revisiting and they've created a new life. It's so hard to go back and think about what happened, but he persuaded many of them and he offered to write forwards for them and really encouraged them to do that and felt that that was a, a really primary community for him both to give to and also to to receive from, to learn from, and to share memories with. So I think we're almost uh, out of time, but I wanted to end on just kind of a little bit of a lighter question. You know, I was very moved about the idea of him having a child as an act of hope, right? This is, there. there is something, uh, I remember working on a speech for President Obama's, for the Holocaust Remembrance Ceremony back in 2009, and I found a statistic that said that they'd done a study of Holocaust survivors in the U.S. as compared to other Jews, and the Holocaust survivors actually had higher birth rates. They had more children than American Jews, and I remember talking to Samantha Power, who was then a colleague, later became our U.N. ambassador, and she said, you know, to think that after all they'd been through, they still felt they had a duty to life, which I just thought was really moving. And, you know, I'm curious, what was he like as a father? And, you know, what did you learn from him about being a father? And certainly some, I imagine some of you are parents or have children in your life who you mentor or you teach. What did you learn from him about that that you've carried forward in your own interactions with kids? Well, I, I've gotten to know Elie Wiesel's son very well and, and we're friends. And so he should really answer that question and has, has a lot to share about. He's written about it. His name is Alicia Wiesel. You can look up some of the articles he's written, um, which is a... Firsthand, very very intimate account of the, of his teenage years of struggling with his father of like rebelling against a lot of the the Jewish life and tradition that that Elie Wiesel taught him, um, and then coming back to it later. Um, 
the most important thing, the most important two things he, he taught me, I think about parenting are number one, when you have a child, you now have a stake in the world in a way that you didn't before. It's possible in other ways, but that's a turning point moment where there's a before and after, right? Where, where before, like if something happens to me, okay, like, you know, it's the end of my world. It's not the end of the world. But, but when you have a child, suddenly you're implicated in everything that happens in the world and everything that happens in, in Syria or Yemen or, or, or wildfires and, and, you know, um, and, and climate change, it becomes so immediate. I mean, like I cared about it before, but it becomes so immediate and so real. And the second thing he said was, um, once I, I asked, we sat together for an hour once and he was incredibly generous and asking how he could support me in different ways as I was figuring out a career move question. And at the end of that conversation, I said, is there anything I can do for you? And he said, just be. And that was something he, he said to me, which is also difficult homework for me, but also something that I took into my parenting to really accept every, every child where, where he or she is as a person, as a unique other, and not, and I struggle with this as a parent of teenagers, and not to impose my own wishes and, and, and uh, desires for them onto their lives. Um, and, you know, that's a hard thing to do as a parent, and it's an easier thing to do as a grandparent, which is why Elie Wiesel said in class once, grandparents and grandchildren just love each other so much because they have a common enemy. <laughs> But I think he wanted. He, I think what I got was borrow some of that grandparent energy, even as a parent. Well, thank you so much. This has been a total joy, and I guess you'll be here signing books, right? Thank so you, please. Sarah. My pleasure. Thank you all.